I found that a big challenge living and working in New Guinea because people were living at a very basic level of existence. And so I found myself having to sleep in little huts on the dirt floor. I'd always put, put a pig in the hut with you to keep you warm at night. That was such a great experience, cuddling up to a pig, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and despite all of our disdain for pigs, <laughs> I found myself many a time sharing the hut with a pig. There'd be rocks on the ground. There'd be mosquitoes buzzing around you, giving you malaria at every opportunity. I've had malaria 16 times. There'd be a little smoking fire in the middle of the hut to try and keep the mosquitoes away and the smoke would almost stifle you. I couldn't keep my head inside the hut. I'd have to put my head out and my body inside. So I practiced doing this in my sleep just to keep the mosquitoes away. <laughs> you never got a good night's sleep. But I slept in those little huts. I ate their food. Some of our missionaries were so so convicted about righteousness by diet. I know it gave me a lot of food for thought. Amen. Especially one missionary, one missionary who happened to be the president of the whole mission. He would, I'd go out, walk about with him for days and weeks at a time and he would carry a backpack filled with the equivalent of Loma Linda Lynx and, and he said to me you never eat anything coming from the natives I said this is ridiculous we're in their country and we don't eat their food I mean most of their food is quite edible I tried not to eat the fried rats and the stewed bats I mean I tried to avoid them but I was not the fussiest of missionaries. I was not a person who had to stir the stew pot. I just took a plateful. But this guy, he thought that I was the biggest sinner that ever walked on two legs because I actually ate the native food. And we, things came to a head between us, I guess you could say. We were in this village where the people had actually built a special house just for us to live in. That's roof, beautiful place, and you could actually stand up in it which was really an unusual thing. You didn't have to crawl in on your hands and knees. They even had a little table and chairs for us to sit on. I thought, my goodness, this is civilization. And they had a young man from the capital city that they had paid for, a chef, to come down and cook for us for the 10 days that we were there, like a camp meeting. So I'll never forget the first night. We are sitting at this little bamboo table and the chef is trying to make an impression on us. A young man, he comes in and he's holding this steaming platter on one hand, very professional-like. I had to remind myself, this is actually the wilds of New Guinea. And he puts it with a flourish down on the table. And I'm sitting there with the president, who has already reached into his backpack and pulled out a can of... Well, I had names for them. I used to call it either the sawdust or rubber. You know? <laughs> and he put a can in front of himself and a can in front of me. And as the chef put the platter down on the table, you've got to remember up till this moment I was a complete and total vegetarian. I had become one along with my mother when she was converted. I'm a healthful living person myself, but I hate people who make it their God. It is offensive. And I usually sit in judgment on everybody else who isn't doing exactly what they're doing. So this young chef put the platter on the table. You know what was on it? Two. Oh no, this was an Adventist village. <coughs> so there, there wouldn't be any pork there. There were two beautifully cooked red emperor fish, the most delicate of all Pacific Ocean fish. 
I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. The president put out his hand and he pushed. Pushed the tray that the guy had spent hours preparing. It was all garnished and everything. Pushed it across the other side of the table. It almost fell onto the floor. And took hold of his can of veggie links, whatever they were, and began to open it. And something happened inside me. I guess you'd call it rebellion. I just said to myself, this is not right. Don't people matter more than me? So I said to him, you'll have to forgive me. I know that'll be hard for you to do, but I'm going to taste one of the fish because of all the trouble that he's gone to. Because I had no idea how delicious the red emperor fish is. <laughs> so I pulled the platter over and I ate my whole fish. It was so good I ate his too. <laughs> I don't think he's ever forgiven me for this even till today. <laughs> he told me that I was an apostate. I said, well, if that's what an apostate is, then I'm one. But I believe that I should offer love to this young man who's put so much. And I don't think I've committed some big sin by doing it. God knows the habits of my life. If there's one thing that Jesus is teaching us, that people matter more than things. And it's so easy in the name of God to be offensive like that, isn't it? I think I probably had my biggest test of all when I, in my first year of ministry. You know, I'd come straight out of the world on a very interesting diet <laughs> growing up. And the first Bible study God ever gave me, a woman who died just recently, I called her before she died, she lived in a little trailer way out in the bush near this country town that I was working in. Anyway, she sent in a card wanting some Bible study lessons and I went out to find her. A shabby little trailer with four kids all jammed into this very tiny little trailer. Anyway, she said, will you come back again? I said, of course I'll come back again. She said, I'm going to cook lunch for you next week. I said to myself, well, this could be interesting. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll be happy for you to cook lunch for me. This woman had nothing. I was embarrassed. I was tempted to offer to bring the food, but I didn't want to embarrass her, so I accepted her generous offer. So I turned up for lunch. She only had one item on the plate. Bacon. She served me a plate of bacon that was it nothing else I sat there looking at it not knowing whether to laugh or cry because <laughs> I grew up eating it that was no big deal to me I looked at that woman I looked at the effort that she put into the little bit of money that she must have had she'd spent on this. This was a luxury for her. She had no idea about my eating habits. She had done this out of love for me. So you know what I did, don't you? I ate it. I ate it. And thanked her profusely later when we studied these matters and she was getting baptized. She said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I said, no. Don't be. She said, but you ate it. I said, I ate it because I didn't want to be the stumbling block to prevent you. And some people would condemn me for that, but that's what I felt impressed to do. And this woman was drawn by that unconditional love and took her stand for Jesus Christ, became a very healthful liver herself. And we, we used to joke about her right up till the time when she died. She became a great missionary for God. These are good lessons for us to learn, you know. Jesus is constantly trying to teach us that if you're practicing righteousness by anything else but the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not going to draw people to God with unconditional love.